Welcome to LTV's Israel Daily. I'm Amit Harari. And coming up in today's newscast... Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu having a lot on his plate juggling between the diplomatic and security domestic issues. Meantime, an African-Islamic majority country opening a new embassy in Israel today, five years after renewed ties. And finally, a taste of the Holy Land's finest expert with RTV's Wine of the Week. The Air Force struck Hamas military sites in the Gaza Strip overnight in response to a rocket attack on southern Israel hours earlier. It was an uneasy night for Israelis living near the border as alarm sounded in Zderot. LTV Steve Leibovitz reports. The Air Force response to a rocket fired at Israel was swift and forceful. Israeli jets targeted facilities in Gaza used for storing chemicals and a workshop for the manufacture of weapons as alarms sounded in Sterot and nearby towns overnight. Footage published by Palestinian sources show fireballs exploding in central Gaza. The Israeli bombing runs were a response to a rocket launch towards Sterot that was intercepted by the Iron Dome air defense system. Targets included an underground rocket production facility, and a Hamas military base, which the IDF described as one of the organization's significant centers of terrorist activity. Palestinians unsuccessfully fired anti-aircraft missiles during the strike. Tragically, the red alert siren was activated in Stero during a memorial for the late Ella Abuxis, who was killed in a Qassam rocket attack 18 years ago. A 50-year-old woman slipped and was slightly injured while attempting to flee to a bomb shelter in Sterot. Magain Davida Dome personnel treated her and evacuated her to hospital. Sirens went off again in Sterot shortly before 3 a.m. As Israel carried out the airstrikes, the military is investigating what triggered the alarm. The rocket was intercepted by the Iron Dome defense system, and this was the second attack in recent weeks. A statement from the PFLP claimed responsibility, saying the rocket was fired in response to a crackdown on female Palestinian security prisoners. A video circulating on social media shortly after the attack Wednesday showed three Iranian-made projectiles similar to the shrapnel found in Sterot, with text on them reading, the female prisoners are a red line. The prison service has been taking disciplinary action against Palestinians held on terror charges who had celebrated the recent terror attack in Jerusalem. Earlier, National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gvir ordered the prison service to shutter two bakeries inside the detention facilities that were supplying security inmates with fresh bread. Right-wing organizations and politicians having long sought to demolish the Bedouin encampment of Khan and Ahmar in Judea and Samaria, something that has been postponed more than once due to intense international pressure. After eight postponements, here comes the ninth. The State of Israel and this time the new right-wing government with many of the ministers placing evacuation as a top priority requested the High Court of Justice to postpone its answer regarding the evacuation of the Bedouin outpost Khan al-Ahmar for four months. The government requested an extension, but in its response to the High Court, it indicated that it was committed to demolishing Khan al-Akhmar in accordance with previous promises it had made to the court to do so in response to requests from the right-wing Regavim organization. The village, located not far from Ali Adumim and believed to be home to fewer than 200 Bedouin residents, was approved for demolition in 2018. According to the authorities, the primarily makeshift shacks and tents being built without a permit, posing a safety risk to the village inhabitants due to their proximity to a highway. For the past four years, the village evacuation being continuously postponed. Human rights advocates, pro-Palestinian organizations and the European Union publicly backing the village. Despite numerous organizations warning that doing so could amount to a war crime because it is against international law to evict people under so-called occupation. Right-wing organization Regavim attacking the government for its postponement request. We're hoping to get a proper response to a national right-wing government as we were promised in the elections. 
the government receiving the mandate to set a Zionist political vision and curb the Palestinian takeover of Area C. Instead, we received the same excuses all over again, and there's no justification for this. This is to be continued. Now with us to speak more about everything Netanyahu has on his plate these days is journalist and JNS Jerusalem Bureau Chief Alex Treyman. Alex, these are certainly very challenging times for uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Now, let's start with security. A shell fired from Gaza and Israeli response targeting terrorist sites. Israelis on the border back in shelters. Is there any change in this other than the usual tit for tat? Well, we've seen these types of volleys launched at uh, Israeli cities, you know, oftentimes over the last several years and uh, almost a year cannot go by without some kind of a conflict. I think perhaps that some of this uh, was fired uh, in timing coordination with uh, Anthony Blinken's uh, visit to the region while Blinken is pushing for calm in the region. You know, there are Hamas and Pizam. Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza that uh, do seek to uh, really instigate conflict. So, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that this is uh, out of the ordinary. And until uh, the Israeli government and the IDF will forcibly uh, change the situation on the ground in Gaza, we can continue to expect uh, rocket salvos from time to time. Now, on the diplomatic front, Netanyahu just held strategic talks with visiting Secretary of State Blinken and now off to Paris to meet President Macron. Is coordination of Iran topping Netanyahu's agenda? What else needs to be discussed with Macron there now in Paris? I think absolutely Iran is the number one issue uh, that uh, Netanyahu wants to wants to deal with. And, you know, we just saw reports even uh, this week that France um, struck against Iranian uh, weapons uh, that had been transferred towards Houthis in Yemen. And you have to wonder if some of those uh, if some of those strikes were were affected with Israeli intelligence, I, I think that even Blinken's trip to Israel, even though there was talk about the Palestinian issue and talk about judicial reform, I think that that visit by Blinken to uh, Jerusalem really focused primarily on the Iranian issue. And I don't really think that Netanyahu would have rushed so quickly off to Paris on just a few days notice if there weren't uh, significant talks dealing with with the Iranian issue. Can you tell us what else is on the agenda there now in Paris in his visit? Well, he's going also to visit with the Jewish community leaders there. Uh, and I think that they're staying uh, over Shabbat uh, as well. Um, so, But I, I definitely think that diplomacy and uh, intelligence sharing and dealing with Iran is, is primary to Netanyahu's visit. He, he's certainly hopeful to convince Macron, uh, who does have some sway in the international community, not to allow uh, the West to re-enter talks into a new JCPOA agreement. Now, turning to domestic issues, Israel's Attorney General Gadi Barav Miara today warned Netanyahu not to interfere in the judicial reform due to a conflict of interest because of his ongoing trial. How much of a problem is this for him, for Netanyahu? Well, I think that we have a brewing constitutional crisis here in Israel where the uh, departments of the judicial uh, uh, pillar of the government are really uh, going to do everything that they can. First, they did everything that they can to prevent Netanyahu from becoming the prime minister be to begin with. And now they're going to do everything that they can to protect the status quo with regard to the way the judiciary works. Uh, and so the idea was that the attorney general could uh, prevent Netanyahu from advancing judicial reforms on the basis of the fact that he's currently under trial, even though the reforms themselves have nothing to do with Netanyahu's trial. The way that Supreme Court justices are selected, has nothing to do with uh, Netanyahu's ongoing cases. And uh, even the, the raised the idea of an override clause in the Knesset really has nothing to do with Netanyahu's trial. And uh, so Justice Minister Yariv Levin and also uh, the head of the Constitutional Committee in the Knesset, Simcha Rothman, have both fired back at the Attorney General saying that it's actually the Attorney General that has a conflict of interest here uh, in preventing the government from advancing uh, legal reforms because those legal reforms would in fact uh, divide up the position of the Attorney General into three separate positions. And now, Alex, there have been mass protests and warnings of economic consequences from a range of leading officials and experts cautioning against this uh, judicial overhaul. Netanyahu does understand economics. Are the naysayers having an impact here? 
Well, we have to see over time. I don't think that they will. I mean, really, the Israeli startup economy uh, continues to boom. Uh, and I don't understand why legal reform would have any uh tie connection to uh, whether or not Israel continues to be an incubator for winning technologies. Uh, and I think that the the danger that's happening here is that, uh, you know, Israel's been fighting against the BDS activities where the international community has been, has been effectively trying to convince companies to boycott, divest, and sanction the state of Israel. And for those now that are turning around and saying that if Netanyahu will enact judicial reform, that that gives an excuse uh, to companies to divest from Israel. In fact, what they're doing is actually promoting BDS, and it's very dangerous. Alex Treyman, it is very dangerous. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.